This lesson on pancreatic pathology is going to focus mostly on the diagnosis acute pancreatitis and teach a lot of stuff about it. Then the back half is about chronic pancreatitis and the one pancreatic cancer. So let's begin talking about acute pancreatitis. Pancreatitis is caused by autodigestion of the pancreas and the peripancreatic fat by digestive enzymes. The zymogens that were supposed to be activated in the duodenum get activated in the pancreas, and they do what they do, which is degrade lipids, proteins, and carbohydrates, which are cells. And so there are three mechanisms that could result in that happening. There's so many defense mechanisms, releases zymogens, trypsin inhibitor, alkaline fluid, and enteropeptidase being in the duodenum, that in order for this to happen, something has to go catastrophically wrong. And so the three proposed mechanisms are ductal obstruction, usually caused by gallstones, cellular injury, representative of alcohol, and a proposed mechanism, impaired transport. This one doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me because lysozymes are worse than digestive enzymes. And as long as the cell holds on to them in a vesicle, doesn't release them, it, nothing bad's gonna happen. And more importantly, the most common cause of pancreatitis is going to be gallstone obstruction and alcohol cellular injury. But these are in pathology texts, so I'm including all three. I want you to focus on the first two. Ductal obstruction is going to cause the inability of flow, right? The whole point of the bicarbonate-rich fluid was to flush the ducts out. If there's an obstruction, flow stagnates, and trypsinogen turns into trypsin and activates everybody else. Cellular injury is more, more about the acinar cells. They have those vesicles, but then something happens to them, and they accidentally release the zymogens prematurely. And so the actual causes can be remembered by the mnemonic, I get smashed, to remind you that alcohol is one of the leading causes of acute pancreatitis. I am using the, this mnemonic, I didn't come up with it, but what I'm gonna do is modify it slightly to turn your attention to the things that actually matter. And those will be the things in red. G and E. S, M, A, S, H in red, E, D in red. I stands for either iatrogenic or idiopathic. Just makes the mnemonic work. G stands for gallstones. And E for ethanol. By far, these two are the most common causes of acute pancreatitis. Only consider the other ones when you have ruled out these two. Trauma is blunt force trauma to the abdomen. The first S is from shock, hypotension. M is mumps, not very, seen very often. A is autoimmune, but autoimmune pancreatitis usually presents as a chronic condition. The second S is my favorite, scorpion stings from, and not just any scorpions, but scorpions from Trinidad. Definitely makes the mnemonic work, otherwise it shouldn't be considered. H is hyper triglyceridemia. And we're not talking about someone who's got dyslipidemia. It's a familial disorder where the, the, the triglycerides are in the thousands. The second E is ERCP, a procedure where endoscopy is done, the sphincter of OD is opened, the scope is passed into the biliary tree, and then dye is injected. 
30% of ERTPs will have some evidence of pancreatitis. And the last D is drugs. There's a lot of them, medications that can cause acute pancreatitis. There are three that I think are high yield for licensing exams. If the diagnosis they carry is diabetes, they'll be on a GLP-1, an injectable like exanatide. If the diagnosis is hypertension, hydrochlorothiazide. If the diagnosis is HIV, didanosine. These are classic medications that cause acute pancreatitis. So first you rule out gallstones and, and alcohol, then you look at triglycerides and medications, and only after all those are negative, you go after all the blue ones. The patient will present with pain and anorexia. Almost everyone has both. There's going to be an epigastric pain. That is worse with food. Eating tells the pancreas to secrete more zymogens. If there's a problem with getting the zymogens to the duodenum, all, all that does is worsens the autodigestion of the pancreas. That epigastric pain is going to be positional. Leaning back makes it feel worse. But it is not pleuritic. This is significant because epigastric pain and substernal chest pain are pretty close to each other. And pericarditis and pancreatitis are commonly considered in the differential diagnosis. Pericarditis will be positional and pleuritic. Acute pancreatitis is positional only and not pleuritic. The patient will also not want to eat. That is anorexia. And it isn't because they have, they, they know consciously that if they eat, their pain gets worse. They won't have an appetite. And there could also be some nausea and vomiting. These are common symptoms. Those that are not common but are pathognomonic are the two ecchymoses, Cullen sign and Turner sign. The umbilicus, umbilicullens, is Cullen sign. The ecchymoses around the umbilicus is Cullen's sign. And Gray Turner, Turner on your side, are flank ecchymoses. The, these necessitate acute pancreatitis that is also hemorrhagic, which is a complication of acute pancreatitis. You almost never see these in actual patients, but they are so classically associated with acute pancreatitis that if you have a test question with them present, you know it's pancreatitis. The diagnosis of acute pancreatitis is made with a lipase. That is increased to three times the upper limit of normal. This is 100% the right thing to do. Amylase is a practice pattern that a lot of people have, which is not a good idea. If you have a pancreatic specific amylase, that's okay. But amylase elevates from just vomiting. So if you have an elevated amylase and not an elevated lipase, all you've said is a symptom of acute pancreatitis is positive. So you'll see people order the amylase, and it's useful when amylase and lipase agree, but you should not use an undesignated amylase level to diagnose acute pancreatitis. If you have the pancreatic specific, you can. And the CT scan is a way of making the diagnosis, but it shouldn't be done on the day of admission if the person has a lipase that's three times the limit of normal. If you already made the diagnosis, don't do the CT scan in addition. The reason for that is that the CT scan isn't harmful. It's that the person who receives that patient in the hospital will be less likely to repeat a CT scan if a CT scan shows no complications on the day of admission. And there's no reason to expose someone to radiation if you've already got the diagnosis. So not a bad thing to do, but if you already made the diagnosis, don't need to do it. And if you did a biopsy, which you should not do, what you'll see is pancreatic liquefactive necrosis, enzymatic digestion. In inflammation and eoplasia, we said pancreatitis is the classic fat necrosis. 
Well, if you biopsy it, you can't biopsy soup. You can't see anything. There's nothing there. The peripancreatic fat, though, can undergo fat necrosis. What you'll see is saponification. Histologically, purple inclusions in adipose cells. The treatment of acute pancreatitis involves bowel rest. Do not give anything by mouth. And you only feed when the patient feels hungry. If you feed them too soon, you will induce more zymogens to be released and you will reset the clock. Acute pancreatitis hurts a lot. And so in addition to bowel rest, you'd have to give pain control. And multiple studies have shown with acute pancreatitis in particular, a PCA pump in which the, there is a basal rate and the patient has control of additional boluses of opiate medication is preferred. It makes the nursing staff feel better about the case, it makes the patient feel better, rather than waiting for the phone call, the nurse is busy doing something else, they're in pain, they're waiting, and the nurse takes 20 minutes to get there. Not the nurse's fault, probably doing something else that was important. The PCA pump is dangerous in the sense that you could overdose them because there's a, a basal rate, but you determine what their needs are each morning and set it appropriately, giving them control of their own pain control while they don't eat and feel pain. Now there are complications that can arise. And I'm gonna make it seem like they're clearly obvious silos based on the presentation and the day at which they present. It's not this simple, but this is an easy way in the very beginning of your training to separate these illness scripts. Most people do not have any of these. Most people just have pain, they wait, they're fed with Rennie, and then they leave. The first complication is necrotizing pancreatitis. Which may seem confusing because obviously there's necrosis. This necrosis is histologic. The necrotizing complication is a gross anatomy structure. Lots of tissue has become necrotized, soup. The way this presents is sepsis on day three. Fever leukocytosis, tachycardia, toxicity, which leads you to get a CT scan. If you find a large amount of pancreatic necrosis, what you should do is get a fine needle aspiration. And if that fine needle aspiration is positive for, for organisms, you use meropenem. This may sound confusing, right? This is an actual recommendation. If someone has pancreatitis, and they develop fever, leukocytosis, and tachycardia, don't draw cultures and give antibiotics. Most people will say, well, hang on a sec. If they're, sepsi if they're septic, I'm going to put them on antibiotics and fluids. I can get the CT scan and the biopsy later, which is appropriate. But on a test question, if they're talking about necrotizing pancreatitis, you don't do meropenem un unless the fine needle aspiration is positive for organisms. And if it's negative, this is usually not done, you may need a necrosectomy, removal of the necrotic tissue. The problem is that the pancreas is essentially lipopolysaccharide from gram-negative bacteria. It's intensely inflammatory. And the second complication is indicative of that. Hemorrhagic. You'll find hemorrhagic by seeing a decrease in the hemoglobin around day three, which prompts the CT scan. What you're worried about isn't the decreasing hemoglobin. It's the fact that it's so inflammatory that decreasing hemoglobin is indicative of a disseminated intravascular coagulation, which we'll talk about in Hemonc. And because it's so intensely inflammatory, if there is hemorrhage, there's probably going to be ac acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, which we'll talk about in Palm. The point is, the hemoglobin dropping is a sign of intense inflammation and a worse prognosis. The third complication is subacute and abscess. This is going to be sepsis, fever, tachycardia, leukocytosis on day seven, so later than necrotizing. CT scan is done, finds the abscess, you drain it, and give antibiotics. 
There is one complication.